You are listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast with Buck Joffrey. Get ready to change your life. Welcome, everybody. This is Buck Joffrey with the Wealth Formula Podcast with the first podcast, Wealth Formula Podcast of 2020. So this uh, this is going to be a great year. I am looking forward to it. I don't know about you, but I will tell you this. Every time New Year's comes along, I become, you know, pretty reflective, right? I start to really think about the things that I'm doing, if I'm headed in the right direction, et cetera. And frankly, I find it pretty helpful. And, uh, you know, I'm not one necessarily to do a lot of New Year's resolutions, although uh, I am thinking about maybe trying to lose like 20, 30 pounds or something like that. But now listen, I'm talking about the, the stuff that you stick to you, when, you, when you really reflect on your life and you start saying, well, this is what I'm doing right. This is what I'm doing wrong. I'm heading in this direct, direction when I really want to be over there, et cetera. This is a really good time to take, take note of all that, particularly because we're in 2020. And as they say, hindsight is 2020. <laughs> anyway, listen, here's a suggestion I have for you. Write down where you are today. What I mean by that is professionally, socially, you know, with your relationships, life, you know, friends and that, family, et cetera. And, you know, see if you like it where it is. And compare that where you would like to be one year from now. Write it down. And it's really, really helpful uh, because if you do that, it can really help you focus in on what is not working, not working. That is what you really need to focus on, in my opinion. You see, it's easy to focus on what is working, right? We're naturally programmed to do that in a way, to run to pleasure and, you know, run away from pain. But in the process, uh, we end up ignoring some things that, uh, that can really kind of just stay as a massive pain in your side for a long period of time. You see, it's much easier, or I should say it's much harder to acknowledge those things that are not working in your life, in your, you know, in, in your, your whatever kind of life, your business life, social life, whatever, uh, than it is. It's much harder to acknowledge those things uh, and to make them go away or have a plan for those things to go away than it is just to let them fester. Yeah, you see this all the time, right? I mean, you see people, uh, you know, in, you know, dating the same person, like, you know, in your, in your 20s or something for like an extra year for no reason at all. That was a big waste of time, wasn't it? Staying at a job that you know it sucks and you hate it, whatever, for a period of time. Well, yeah, do something about that. You got to change it because this principle of getting rid of things that aren't working and, you know, ridding yourself of anything that doesn't bring you joy applies to all parts of life, relationships, investments, jobs. If you own a business or businesses, whatever, if it isn't working and you know deep down it ain't going to change, then it's time to get rid of it. And, you know, for me personally, as, as an entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur, I think it's fair for me to call myself that. A lot of people call themselves that, and I'm not doing it to, uh, you know, pump myself up because the reality is an entrepreneur is uh, just you're born that way. And, you know, you have failures, you have lots of failures, you have a lot, you know, hopefully you have some successes. But as a serial entrepreneur, you know, typically you're going to have more failures than successes. And I can tell you that is the case for me. And I can tell you that I have, have had to give up on things and, and get rid of them several times. Sometimes businesses do great. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they do great for a while. And then, you know, uh, you get emotionally attached even though something isn't working anymore or something you don't really want anymore. Uh, and you just let it continue uh, to, you know, sort of stick around your neck like an albatross and weigh you down. You know, we've all been there. Think about it. Think about it. I mean, if you don't think this applies to you, just think about, you know, 
the 90% of your life that is great, right? Now, there's probably 10% that is not great. But yet, the amount of energy that goes into that 10%, so much of the time, so far exceeds the 90% that is really great. So what do you do in that circumstance? You got to get rid of the 10%. Just get rid of anything that is not bringing you joy. And believe me, I know that there's, you know, temporary pain involved in that, emotional, financial. But if you do it, I truly believe from personal experience that it is worth it. It is worth it. You know, a few years ago, I decided that I didn't want to practice medicine anymore. And I wanted to move to Santa Barbara. I didn't want to live in Chicago anymore. And that was a tricky transition and frankly, one that was not without substantial risk. However, had I not eliminated medicine as my vocation and Illinois as my home address, I would not have focused on what has ultimately been the most successful and most gratifying businesses of them all for me, which is uh, this whole multifamily real estate business uh, activity that I've been involved in the last uh, several years, but really have focused in on, uh, you know, full time for the last couple of years. I've been lucky for sure. You see, the success of any venture depends not only on the endeavor itself, right? The type of business model, et cetera, the business, but also on the people with whom you partner, you know, and on my road to success in, in my real estate business, finding the right people has been the most difficult part. But you see, this is, uh, this is where, you know, having more time to focus on the good things in your life really pays off. In my case, perseverance and creating relationships, doing due diligence on people and businesses and getting to know people personally and professionally and really digging deep into things, they have really, really paid off in the last couple of years. I mean, huge, hugely for me, not only for me, but for this investor group that we have, investor club, um, you know, for our credit investor group, if you know the types of stuff that we're, we're getting in there, it's just really high quality stuff. And um, I'm really proud to have these relationships and these partnerships. Um, by the way, if you don't know uh, what Investor Club is, it's, you know, our credit investor group. It's where the magic happens. If you want to sign up, go to Investor Club at WealthFormula.com. Now, some of you, or a lot of you, are already in Investor Club and know who Dante Andrade is. He's my partner in one uh, of the newer companies that, uh, that we formed together. Neither one of us is new to real estate, but a, a partnership between us is pretty new over the last, um, last year uh, called Turo Asset Management Group. Turo focuses on working class multifamily real estate, specifically in the Dallas submarket. We have a pretty, you know, unique model, I think, for this time um, in the cycle, which is a hybrid cash flow and value add strategy, which I think has appealed to a lot of our uh, investor group. Anyway, I'm very lucky to have Dante as a partner. I mean, he is one of the most meticulous underwriters uh, and operators I've, I've ever known. And he really, really knows his stuff. So in this week's uh, Wealth Formula podcast, uh, I decided I'm just going to talk to Dante because he's just a wealth of knowledge. Uh, we have obviously a ton of, uh, you know, uh, interest in multifamily real estate, whether that's through syndication, uh, investing in syndications, whether that's, you know, buying stuff on your own, et cetera. It's something that, you know, most people are interested in. So, pretty laid back conversation uh, we had together um, and uh, you should learn a lot uh, whether you are an old hat at multifamily real estate in general or just thinking about it I'm quite sure you're going to take something away from this conversation which we will get back to right after these messages. Welcome back to the show everyone today my guest on Wealth Formula podcast is Dante Andrade. Dante is uh, a man of many multifamily real estate hats. He is a buyer's broker in Dallas. 
meaning that he is dedicated to the buyer side of acquisition of large multifamily real estate. Uh, he has uh, he's been involved in just under a billion dollars worth of transactions, focusing again specifically in the the uh, Dallas Fort Worth market. He's also a real estate coach and mentor, and finally, and most importantly, he's my partner in Turo Asset Management Group uh, as we acquire uh, cash flowing multifamily real estate in Dallas. Dante, uh, people know you left and right already on the show, but welcome to the program. Thank you, Buck. Excited to be here. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, talk multifamily. It's exciting. Yeah. You know, it's it's great, um, you know, uh, to, to talk to you about multifamily because, you know, you approach it as, um, and from many different ways that I think uh, uniquely uh, add to the investor experience, um, you know, having the... Uh, you know, the constant underwriting and the evaluation of these kinds of properties and on top of that coaching others. So it's been, uh, it's been a really uh, great experience. Um, you know, Dante, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, multifamily real estate. It's obviously such a core focus of what we do, particularly in the, uh, the uh, Wealth Formula Investor Group. Um, and there are, of course, lots and lots of things to invest in out there, right? I mean, we get we get we get all, we get bombarded with things Plenty to invest in. Yes. Yeah, and it, sometimes. Right, right. And it's not just and it's not just uh, real estate either, right? It's outside of real estate Correct. as well. And uh, but you know the funny thing is that you and I were we met in Dallas recently and I just looked at you and I was like, you know, I don't see the point. You know, we were I was talk I was out there in Dallas meeting with the family office about some things and it sounded exciting and I was doing the numbers and I'm like, still doesn't look like the kind of the numbers that we can get. And in something like real estate now, in your opinion, why multifamily? Why now? I mean, listen, people talk about, uh, you know, maybe it's the market is too hot, et cetera. Um, you know, why, you know, why multifamily in particular? So, so give me your perspective on that. Give me a specific you know, your approach in terms of identifying, you know, the right kind of multifamily, why and why do we continue to do this as we go into 2020 here? Sure. Uh, great question. I, uh, you know, I, I, I call it, you know, what are you talking about? We're looking at these different options as kind of the, the shiny object syndrome, right? And we have people right, right. offering different things all the time. And, you know, as entrepreneurs, you know, you are, always have a tendency to say, hey, what else is out there? You know, what else can I look? What else can I get my hands on? Uh, and I have forced myself to be disciplined and not be, you know, distracted by the shiny objects of different things, just because what we're doing is working really well. And I'm speaking from my own experience and the deals that we've worked together, but, but also uh, with all my clients that I represent. And I've been doing that for several years and seeing their progress and the trajectory that everybody goes through and the results uh, all around. So, and there are different, very few assets out there that you're looking at. You are able to have cash flow, appreciation, tax advantages, inflation, you know, protection against inflation. Uh, there are so many factors uh, to multifamily that really makes it hard to, you know, in my own view, to compare to, uh, to anything else. We're able to, you know, with the cash flow, you're able to... Uh, diversify the risk, right? Because if you're just fixing on the appreciation, if you're fixing on new development, for example, you know, you're going to put in all this money up front and then three years from now, you may or may not get a payout. If there is a turn in the market, if there is a turn in the lending conditions, that payment is not guaranteed. And the way I look at a cash flow is really insurance because from day one, the kind of properties that we're buying, we're looking at cash flowing from day one, you're already getting a return on your investment. And if that big payout comes at the end in a couple of years, three, five years uh, with a sale or with a refinance, oh, that's great. But if for some reason the market turns, the lending turns, there are different factors uh, and that does not happen, you already got your cash flow, right? You already got most of your money back and, you know, and depending on how long you hold it, you got profits also. So uh, yeah. it's, it's really hard to find something that's going to do an inflation hedge cash flowing, appreciation, and tax advantages, which are huge right now, 
also, you know, with the bonus depreciation, the laws that President Trump put in place, uh, you know, they're going to run until 2021. And I think I, you know, truly believe that that's going to be extended. Uh, and I, I hope so. But we are taking full advantage of it, you know, until 2021. And we'll see what happens at that point. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, uh, you've hit on a, a number of things that, uh, you know, we talk about frequently. I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting is that when you talk about, when you talk about cash flow, it's a little bit different from what I think the, you know, traditional idea of cash flow is. I mean, certainly there is that element of, you know, residual income. But one of the other things that you mentioned is effectively what, what cash flow does is every time you get paid some sort of dividend, it, um, it effectively de-risks your, your investment, right? Your capital. Correct. You're getting a piece of it back, so that's a that's a different way to look at it. Cash flow is a, a way to de-risk. It's also yeah, it's really a like way insurance policy, you know, against against right. your investment. You still own this asset, same percentage, but you're already getting some of your money back right away. And to a certain extent, that also helps you understand that okay, um, you know, even if there's a slowdown in the economy, as long as there's still some demand with demographics and with population growth, which we know there is, regardless of what's going on with the economy, population, demographics, that sort of thing, you know, uh, in, a, in, in a market particularly like Dallas, where, you know, the, the effects of, of recessionary uh, dynamics, certainly even in 2008, 2009, were not nearly as uh, dramatic as they were in other markets. It, it helps you just kind of have a little bit of peace of mind. And also, sure. obviously, the tax benefits, specifically in 2021, we know the million tax benefits that come from multifamily real estate. But now let's talk about, certainly, um, you know, the, we, we talked about multifamily real estate. There is this element of, you know, having a roof over your head. So that's always helpful too, right? I mean, people are going to give up. Businesses go out of business. Uh, you know, in, 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 in commercial real estate, uh, retail does poorly, but ultimately people need a place to live. And does that influence when you look at multifamily uh, investments, whether you do an A class or B class or C class type property, um, maybe you could just describe what those things are for people and, and kind of give me a sense for kind of your perspective in terms of, especially right now, where where the best place might be and why? Yes, so that is very true. We're looking at, uh, uh, like you mentioned, huge population growth. Uh, we have, you know, I was looking at uh, some statistics, and we've had about uh, a huge drop on the population under 35-year-olds that actually own their own homes. So mm -hmm. it's down to a low of 37% of the 35 and under owning their home. And... Also, at the same time, and that's, you know, created by different factors. Uh, we're not building as many homes as we did back, you know, everybody that's carried from 06, 07, 08. And at the same time, the prices have moved up a lot, right? We've had huge appreciation uh, across the country on the price of home, home ownership. Also, a lot of the counties putting a lot of pressure on uh, property taxes. Uh, so, and people are just more mobile, you know, uh, the millennials are not into owning the big home and moving to the suburbs. They want to stay in the city. They want to travel. They want to be mobile. People are changing jobs very quickly and they want the flexibility to just say, I can break my lease. You know, if I pay a two months fine, which I've seen many employers doing that, you know, they'll pay the fine, uh, has happened to us at our properties that the employer will pay the, the fine for the tenant, uh, to, to move. Uh, you know, and if you have a house, it's a much complicated process. So there is a whole demographic shift uh, that it's all of it is pointing to apartments. And that's why it's been so hot and it's been performing so well, you know, for so many years, if you're picking the right markets. Um, we have like breaking down the classes, you know, we have class A, class B, class C, and there is class D, even though Class D only exists depending on who you ask, right? If you're talking to a listing broker, there is never a Class D. It's always, <laughs> it's always, a, yeah. That's right. it's it's always a, a Class C class property, D. even though, you know, if it's all beat up and boarded up windows and, you know, and homeless people living in the property, oh, it's a Class C in that uh, right, upcoming right. neighborhood. But if right. you're talking to uh, 
on my side of the business, yeah, we're, we're, there are some class D properties. We do not buy those. Uh, you know, those are not properties that are going to uh, cash flow right away. They are riskier also. Um, and the same way I feel about the class A. So class A is your brand new construction. The stuff that you see, a lot of the high rises, um, a lot of the, which you have a lot of them being built in dollars right now, but it's the high end of our apartment complexes that are being built with the latest features, larger units, uh, most of them are Uber and core areas. And then class B, you have the properties that have been built in the 80s and the 90s. Some of them on the 2000s, uh, you know, they're, now they're like A minus or they're actually a B plus because we've had a lot more new construction show up. And then you have class C, which we call it workforce housing, which is a properties built between the 50s, 60s, all the way to the 80s. Uh, and a lot of them have gone through different times of rehab, renovations and improvements. And some of them are untouched. Uh, I just had a client purchase a property here about a month ago, a complex of about 220 doors that the developer, the family of the developer was selling it. Uh, and this was something that was built in the 60s. So they owned that property at a very unbelievable low basis and it was completely untouched, right? So a huge value add play. Uh, they're gonna do really well with that property. So, and that's what we're looking at. Uh, and you can have properties on each one of those classes, mostly on the B and C, that are yield play, meaning you're gonna buy the property to collect uh, yield, collect the cash flow, or you can have some that are value add, which you're coming in to infuse a lot of money, rehab the units, make improvements, change the management, and be able to raise rents. Uh, the, the ones that I like to buy is a hybrid. Uh, you know, it's not always perfectly 50-50, but something that's yielding already a return, that's cash flowing, that's stable, that got occupancy 90% and, and higher. But at the same time, we have opportunities to infuse fresh capital, change uh, things on the property, rehab the units, maybe change the curb appeal, um, make changes to increase the value, force the appreciation of the property. So fighting a hybrid between those two is, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's the perfect setting uh, and applies to both the C and the B class. And yeah. people keep asking, um, how about all this new construction happening on the A class? Isn't that going to affect the rents? We have a, such a huge disparity between the rents that are being charged to the A class. Uh, against what you have on B and C class, um, that is just has not affected. Even here in Dallas, that we've had delivery of about twenty three thousand units this year so far, of brand new A class. You know that supply has been you know picked up by all the people that are moving in, and and it's a completely different demographic group that we're talking about. The people that are on the working uh, workforce housing, comparing to the one that's being built right now. Yeah, it's, it's interesting too, because if you look at it from the standpoint of, uh, first of all, you know, A-class, I mean, um, type properties, they, they are difficult. If you're buying an A-class property, it's probably, uh, you know, purely, it's almost like buying gold, right? You're just buying, you're not going to expect much of a cash flow type situation at all. Sometimes, you know, uh, I have been exposed to and I've been asked by um, some people to look at opportunities uh, in the development space in, uh, in Dallas and in other markets. And, um, you know, those look like they're opportunities for perhaps a little bit more yield. And, but when I look at the annualized return projections, they always end up being, you know, somewhere between 15 and 20%. To me, right. when I think about that, I'm like, well, we're already, what would you rather have? Zero cash flow, zero nothing until this thing is built and have all of the variables for three, four years, however long it takes to build this thing and then get people into there, and then hope for a bump that gives you a projected 20% annualized return or something that literally day one, we can say we're gonna get nine, 10% cash on cash year after year from the projection and we're projecting a 20% annualized return. Inherently, which one sounds like a safer bet? Which one has less variables to it? Which one has more certainty to it? And then it becomes, to me, it becomes like a no-brainer, right? I mean, I, I, you know, I know people like to invest in developments and that sort of thing, but I think it's, it, to me, it just doesn't sound as safe. It doesn't sound as, um, you know, as predictable. 
I agree with you. In my opinion, maybe biased because, you know, this is what I do day in and day out. But right. and then people say, oh, but you got to diversify. You have to diversify. And I have my own way of diversifying, which is investing in different markets in different areas. Right. So I personally buy in DFW, I buy the, the Texas market. But I'm sometimes if I'm wanting to diversify, I'm looking at other uh, syndicators that are doing deals in other areas of the market and investing with them. And that's how I'm diversifying not putting all my eggs in one property, but at the same time, even within dollars, looking at different uh, pockets uh, and just spreading the money around the, the, the different multifamily assets. It's just because it, it, feels, it feels the safest, you know, out of all the, uh, the options that are out there. Right. I mean, certainly, uh, you know, I, I get the diverse, diversification argument all the time. But again, when you look at what um, anything with remotely similar yield projections out there, the risk <laughs> the risk goes way up, right? The yeah, risk yeah. risk uh, goes way up. I mean, it's like uh, you know, operating businesses, A-class properties, commercial properties, et cetera, uh, might provide potentially similar yield. But then now you're talking about something, in my view, that has substantially higher risk profile. Mm -hmm. So um, talk about the ideal size of a property. In your opinion, um, you know, from the standpoint of scale and stability, what do you like? You know, what, what size do you like? Why? I like, so uh, for it to make sense financially on the cash flow, uh, you want to look at properties that are 100 doors and more, right? Uh, 100 doors you can handle with one full-time staff on the maintenance, one full-time staff in the office. Uh, if you buy something that's 70 doors, uh, it's still going to take one full-time in the office, one full-time in the uh, outside, right? So you get 30% more if you, instead of buying 70, you're buying 100, but you have the same expenses for payroll. Uh, and I like buying between 200 and 300. That's the sweet spot uh, uh, for me personally. I think when you get too much uh, bigger than that, when you get, I mean, in up to 300, 350 doors, when you get higher than that, you start, uh, you know, having some uh, descaling, uh, which means everything that you're going to do is at a really, really huge volume. Uh, becomes a little harder to operate. Still doable if the if the uh, the operator has the has the infrastructure to do it. It can be done, but it's just harder because the amount of, amount of people you're gonna have moving, the amount of rehabs you're gonna be rehabbing, you know, 40 units, uh, you know, a month instead of doing you know five to ten when you're working with uh, uh, a property that's 170, 200, 250 units. So that's the size that um, I think it's 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 very manageable. Uh, it's easy to forecast what's going to happen and it's easy to look at the rent roll and look at the financials and say, all right, this is the trend where it's going. And it's, it's really about moving, you know, a cruise ship or moving, you know, a smaller yacht that you can have more flexibility, uh, but not at the same time dealing with something too small, which you're going to be more adverse to vacancies and things like that. And that's one of the things I think is important to understand too, is that, um, what we're really talking about here, because, you know, some people might be listening saying, well, gosh, what about if I just want to go out there and, you know, buy a 10 unit building or 20 unit building or whatever. The reality is that's a completely different business, right? It's a different business altogether. One is being a landlord, right? You're a landlord. If you own 10, 15, 20 units, whatever, or a single family house, you are a landlord. That is a completely different model than owning a larger property because a larger property when you own something that's 150, 200 units is owning a small business. And so then a lot of these things that Dante's talking about, like expenses, et cetera, vacancies become a lot more predictable. And, you know, if you have four units and one person moves out, all of a sudden that's a difference between 100% and 75% um, right. occupancy. So this is a completely different model. And what, um, you know, in, in, one, in one sense, you know, people talk about having the control, et cetera, of the smaller units, but it, it is a lot more volatile. And so for me personally, I mean, I used to do that stuff, but I've sort of realized that it doesn't make sense. Increased scale ultimately helps, you know, to mitigate a lot of these things like the impact of capital expenditures too, right? If you have single family homes, yeah, you got one furnace in each one. You got one roof in each one. I mean, it's just these things become very, very expensive, and it's a difference. And time again. consuming also to manage. You know? I mean, the time that you're going to invest on them, uh, it's uh, it, it it takes a lot. And uh, being able to have someone full time at the property or team 
at the larger properties handling all those issues. It's like you said, the difference between being a landlord and being a business owner. So even though we are in the rental business, we are not landlords, right? We have right. Uh, we have a business. We're asset managers. You know, correct. Yeah. Asset managers, uh, you know, the business is, uh, the ma management company is being the landlord. Uh, it's, you know, fulfilling that function. Uh, you know, I do not get to know the tenants. Uh, you know, I do not know. I mean, I, I look at reports. I look at the rent roll. I understand the demographics, but I do not know tenants one by one. I sometimes I like to sit in the office and they have no idea that I'm actually the owner, you know, and I sit in the office, my computer, I just sometimes want to see what's happening uh, in the office and they're coming. If it's a complaint, just to kind of get a vibe of how the staff is handling, you know, the tenants. But uh, I, I like that disconnection that the tenants have no idea that I'm actually the owner of the property. Um are your, uh, let's talk a little bit, shift a little bit. It, it, you know, obviously when we do stuff, we're just sticking in DFW because that is, you know, that's your place and that we're, we're leveraging off the fact that, you know, um, you know, the ins and outs of that market extraordinarily well. Um, I mean, the nuances, you know, just walking and driving these, you know, these buildings with you, it's, 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 it's unfair advantage, right? I mean, you look at these people who are buying from all sorts of different markets. They have no clue of the level of detail that, that you know. Um, what, other, what other markets in general, I mean, uh, were, were you even thinking about and why as a passive? Because I know as, an, you know, as, as somebody who's uh, an operator, somebody who's you know, doing syndication on the general partner side, you're not. But uh, what other markets do you like? I really like, um, you know, here in Texas, I really like Houston. Uh, right. And I think Houston has a little bit of a stigma because of, you know, the floods and the hurricanes that we've had before. Uh, but it's a market that's doing really well. It used to be an economy that was very oil central, centralized all around oil. That has changed. You still have a big percentage on that, but that has changed. Houston has become a way more diversified economy. Uh, and the city is doing really well. And it has scared a lot of operators because of the floods, which, uh, you know, what happened a few years ago is, you know, like they say, one in a 500 years kind of flood. And everybody that had their property insured uh, fared really well. I had clients with uh, properties in Houston and they did just fine, uh, if anything, even better uh, because they were fully insured and uh, that took care of, uh, of their assets. Uh, Houston has been challenged a little bit because of the of the storms uh, on the insurance standpoint. Insurance is uh, really high at the moment, and this has happened with the Texas market several times, where you have a flood and you have a few hurricanes back to back. Unfortunately, we had a tornado go through this, you know middle of the city of Dallas, which had happened in a long time. So a lot of the carriers all move away, price of insurance goes up, and then as soon as we have one or two years that nothing happens one by one these scares start coming back and insurance price becomes more competitive so it has happened many times i've watched it happen in and out here in texas and we're in the middle of paying a little higher premium for insurance right now especially in houston which has scared a lot of operators but some people they're getting on the ground right now with the high insurance costs are probably going to take advantage if we do not have another storm over the several next few years that the insurance price will be coming back down uh, and we have a lot of employment, a lot of growth in Houston. So that's a market that I like, uh, that I, I personally invest in, and I'm working with clients in that area. And uh, a couple of other markets is really in Florida. Uh, we got Orlando, which is just like Houston. Orlando used to be Disney World, and that's where everybody uh, thought about. But it has, the city has rebuilt itself over uh, the past decade and really becoming a center for entrepreneurship and becoming a center for a lot of corporation they want to be based there because it's easy of access uh, a lot of conference right i mean you have a lot of a huge hotel infrastructure uh there is a lot of job growth in the city of orlando and it's doing really well the price per door is a little on the higher side uh, but there is another area in florida not too far from there which is the tampa and st pete's area right. so that's another market that you can still get properties uh 80, 90,000 a door, 100,000 a door uh, for, you know, C-class, multifamily uh, apartments. And it is an area that's have a huge growth of employment, uh, population migration also, just like we have in Dallas. 
Uh, and, you know, I think St. Pete's people, you should think of it. It was just, you know, I personally think as one of the most beautiful sunsets in the country. People thought it was a vacation place, like a place in Florida, but it's not. It's a happening city. Uh, Tampa is well served with, you know, international airport and uh, that area is booming. And there is a lot of rent growth happening right now. And it's funny to see some of those properties are still renting for some of them. I had a, a client that they purchased one for, you know, the, the rents were 85, 90 cents uh, per square feet. So that's a lot of opportunity. I don't think that's going to stay like that for very long. Yeah, and that's a great opportunity. You mentioned Houston, for example. I mean, the um, obviously another partner with Western Wealth Capital. They we do some things in Houston, and what's remarkable about a market like Houston is is that there is so much space for a bump. Right? Mm-hmm. Arguably, there's more volatility in those markets. Right? But, but the opportunity for a bump is is significant. Whereas if you take a market like Dallas. I think of it as a highly, highly stable market, right? And highly, uh, generally, um, you know, a lot more predictable. Um, and that's, of course, one of the reasons we, you know, you and I have decided to focus there. Obviously, you live there. It's the advantage of, uh, you know, talk about the advantages. I mean, you're obviously, you looked at these markets and you invest in them. You, you know, you might help, you know, people work through some of the underwriting there. But what is the, you know, what is your, what do you see as your, you know, single market advantage, being a guy who just really buys in one market? Like what kinds of things can you do? What kind of things uh, can you, um, you know, what, what kind of advantages can you have from having that kind of intimate knowledge with one market? Uh, you know, people talk about how all real estate is local, right? And so you can be hyper local. Give us some examples of some of the things that, you know, that you knew about that others didn't know about and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. And I've, I've, I feel like I've been very lucky. I've been living in Dallas for almost 20 years now and know the area I have lived in different areas of the Metroplex, uh, went to school here. Uh, so feel very lucky that I happen to be in this booming, uh, space for real estate and the, having the local knowledge of the different areas, Number one, it saves time at the beginning of the underwriting process, right? Of just knowing where the, where the, the properties are. Uh, but getting to the numbers, uh, whenever you know what the location is, what kind of tenants you're going to have in that area. Also getting to know, it, and it, it, it's funny how it happens to be a very small uh, group of people that are investing and are managing this property. So the property that we're buying right now, Tierra del Sol, uh, in the city of Irving, uh, which will close in here in, a, in about a week. We have, uh, I happen to know the guy that owns the property next door to me. And then I'm very close friends of a guy that owns another large property a mile down the road. And also the guy that owns across from there. So you ended up getting to know all the players, right? And we all uh, work together to help each other and uh, to, to be successful. So I got, so I was competing on this property with some people from New York and New Jersey, big players that were trying to get into the market, but they did not have the local knowledge. They did not have, you know, access to the information on these neighboring properties that I had just for have local knowledge of the people that are doing business in the area. Same time, just walking the properties and going through due diligence and getting to know the tenants, getting to know what do those tenants, uh, as you're going through and asking questions, I love just going you know, as we're inspecting the property, just walk around and, you know, um, many of them just think it's an inspection that we're doing. And I'm asking, hey, is there anything that I, you know, that, would, that you need in your property? Is there anything that we can improve? Is there any issues with security, with safety, with, uh, you know, uh, plumbing? And the tenants will always start talking right away, especially, uh, you know, many of them that are Spanish speaking, if you, you know, they usually like to start speak Spanish with them and they open up and they, they, they feel a trust level and they just share you know, things that are going on with the property, with the neighborhood. So that helps a lot, just being hands-on, being that, that area. Uh, one example, we were going through Tierra del Sol, and we looked at some of the, there was a big demand for three bedrooms. We didn't have many of them. Uh, and then we decided to convert some of the large two bedrooms to three bedrooms. And we're like, okay, we think it's going to work. You know, we're looking at business owners. But then as I'm walking through the properties, I saw a lot of the tenants putting a curtain on this wall that we're planning to build a real wall and they were already doing that. So just being there and touching and seeing what was happening, it was reaffirmation that, you know, our plan was working, that the tenants already wanted. And I was, I'm asking them, what do you think about having all? We like, oh no, that'll be great. 
you know. So little details like that. Knowing the counties, that's a big deal here uh, in DFW. We have different counties around. Each one of them run a very different process with the property tax evaluations. So if you buy something in Tarrant County uh, and you buy something in Dallas County, completely different approach. It has to do with taxes. Uh, so getting to know the people that are doing the tax appraisals, getting to know some of them, had a conversation right before we bought uh, Tierra del Sol with a guy that worked for the Dallas County Appraisal District for several years. And he kind of walked me through exactly what would be paying property taxes over the next few years. Uh, so, but if someone comes from the outside and they look at Tarrant County in the same way that they look at Dallas, uh, they're going to be in for surprise. And that's probably going to hurt their cash flow. Uh, just not having the local knowledge. Uh, there was a city that decided the other day to add a $50 charge uh, per year on every unit, just on the water bill. So if you're looking at the water bill as you know a rule of thumb, oh, this is too high, we can reduce to this. Well, if you don't know that detail about the city that's implementing, you know, and this is happening, we have uh, City of Dallas itself now forcing all the operators to have uh, recycling. So you kind of your trash expense is going to double. So if you, if you don't know that, uh, looking from the outside, you know, those little details uh, makes a big difference. I, I, I like to say to my clients that uh, the deals are being made on the details. The deals, you know, if you look at OM, if, you look, if you're looking just at the big picture, you're not going to see a deal, right? You're going to see very low returns. Uh, but when you dive in, and you look at the numbers and the details, what can you do with this unit? What kind of tenants do you have here? Are you gonna try to change the tenant base? What kind of companies are moving to the area? Uh, if you are able to look at those details uh, with the knowledge of the local market, that it's a big, uh, makes a big difference and allow you to be a little more competitive and, and just do better with those properties. You know, um, just listening to you talk, I mean, I know how granular you get, you know, walking units, literally pretending to be, uh, you know, people get comps all the time, but, you know, Dante's going in there pretending to be a, a tenant and, and walking around. It's a different level of getting comps, right? But, you know, um, when, when, when people uh, get into this real estate world, you know, some people are still trying to figure out if they should, you know, potentially buy apartments on their own. Uh, should they, you know, take the leap into syndication or should they invest passively? Um, and I don't have advice for anybody on that other than to say that there are very, very different things. And one thing that I can tell you uh, from watching Dante is uh, if you go the syndication route as an operator, uh, the, op the operations, even the underwriting, this is an incredible amount of work if it's done right. Talk a little bit about that, just so that people who are sort of on the fence and thinking about it, they can get an idea of what kind of time commitment, what kind of, you know, work that goes into being a successful operator uh, in, in, in multifamily real estate. Sure. Yeah. Great question, Buck. And I'll, I'll address the three types. And I've, you know, I, I, I happen to play in two of them and work with clients in all three of the, the types of owners that you can be with multifamily. Number one is buying a property outright by yourself without investors, right? So it's your own money plus a, a, a lender. Uh, the, the advantage on that, you get the biggest tax advantage while doing that. Now, there are several disadvantages which is uh, you're going to have to have a massive amount of money uh, to do that, right? To be able to buy a property that's on the larger size, which you can have full-time employees handling the day-to-day -day for you so you don't become a landlord, you're going to be talking about several million dollars that you're going to have to put in uh, to be able to acquire the property. If you're able to do that, at the same time, you are putting all your money in just one asset, right? So you're lacking on the diversification. You get the tax advantage, but then you put in everything in just one. As a risk standpoint, you want to spread, you know, the amount of money that you're looking to invest, you know, throughout different properties, uh, throughout different, you know, some markets. Uh, the other uh, method, which is, you know, people well, and then about, just to add to that, if you're taking yeah. down a big property on your own, you're bringing all the equity in yourself. This goes for even if people are talking about smaller, you know, 20 units, 30 units, whatever then even if you're bringing in four or 500,000 instead of, you know, four or 5 million or whatever, that's, um, that risk is all on you, 
right? So you have to have confidence that you can operate this thing. That's a big, big part of it. So correct. anyway, we go. Yeah, yeah, but correct. I mean, be able to operate or be able to select the right management company. And I think uh, it plays a big part to, you know, this is not something that you buy and you hand it to the management company and then you walk away. Right. Uh, and, and we see those type of properties all the time. We buy from those kinds of operators all the time because we have, you know, the East Coast or the West Coast person that just buys, you know, the, does a 1031 out of California and, oh, I'm just going to buy a 200 unit in Dallas and it's just going to run on its own. And it does not work that way. Not have Even if you have a reputable management company, I think it plays a big part of being there and making sure that the staff know that the management company know there is an owner, right? This is not an out-of-state REIT that owns this, that no one is accountable for it. Uh, even the, I mean, large operators here that I'm, you know, very familiar with, if the, the owner of the company himself is not doing that anymore, they have asset managers. They are visiting the property. They are getting to know the staff. So that's, that, that's what it takes to be successful uh, on the syndicating model or on your own ownership. So just buying and letting the property run by itself, uh, it's most likely not going to work out and we'll, you know, we'll be making an offer for your property as soon as, you know, get you a point that the, uh, the lender not to is be saying, too hey, discouraging to there, but, but, but the <laughs> bottom line is it's, it's, it's a lot of work and, it is, and, yeah. and, and tell, tell me, tell people about what the work is because I think, as you mentioned, I think very appropriately. I mean, one of, one of the lessons that I had early on when I got into uh, buying real estate was that, you know, it's not as easy as the math. Math is really easy and um, to look at and you can get fooled by math very easily too because, you know, those numbers are given to you by somebody and if you don't know the details of what you're plugging in where, you're going to get it wrong and it doesn't take much. Uh, to get wrong from going into something that looks like it's going to cash flow positively significantly to, you know, breaking on the other end. So, so, so what, you know, what do you think in terms of, um, you know, to talk about some of the specific elements um, that go into being a day to day, you know, real estate operator, as opposed to somebody who's doing this kind of uh, as a side gig. Okay. Yeah. So on the day to day, kind of, I'm going to use here the example of a syndicator. Uh, you are looking uh, uh, two, two parts of the business. One, you're looking for properties to buy, right? And that's a very sometimes um, discouraging process because you're going <laughs> to yeah. make several offers, right? And then you're going to get a few that you're going to get close. Then you're going to have even fewer that you're going to be second place. And then hopefully you're going to get one. So uh, it's competitive, especially on the markets that are hot, the markets that we have a lot of money moving in. So you're going to put in, I would say, about 30 to 40 hours. If you're getting all the way to best and final to really be competitive, uh, you know, because anybody can send an offer, right? Anybody can write an LOI. It's non-binding. It's very simple. Say, oh, yeah, look at the property. I toured I like it. I'm going to send that offer. Well, do you really know what the property is going to trade at, right? I mean, the brokers give you that number. Is that really going to trade at that number? We have a lot of brokers actually underpricing the properties to create competition. And then the price is actually trading much higher. So getting down to the numbers and understanding, okay, what, what is the debt that we can get from this property? So several lender discussions, talking to different lenders and trying to understand also from the lenders underwriting, right? Because the lender at the same time can put a term sheet in front of you and say, oh, this is what we're going to get. But once you go to Fannie Mae and that doesn't happen, now you have hard money tied up and you already promised your investor or something. So getting to understand what goes in underwriting the deal, what Fannie Mae is actually one should see, right? Because lenders competing, uh, mortgage brokers competing to get the business, they are going to be really aggressive, but really Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac are the ones making the decision at the end. So uh, there's a lot of time involved into that. Insurance uh, discussions, property tax, you now understanding, as I mentioned before, uh, going through the round of offers. And many times we have, you know, properties that are competitive. So we're going to have one, two, three rounds of offers. Then you're going to have seller interviews. And each one of these you're preparing, you know, for, and at the same time, due diligence that you're trying to do up front. So uh, in dollars, in the mo um, most major markets now, you have hard money. I mean, non-refundable money from day one. So you do not get to do the full inspection that you do at the property before you actually commit your money. 
uh, and we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars, that that's all the risk is on this indicator, right? So uh, you're taking on that risk upfront. So you have to cover your bases. You have to do the due diligence and understand really what is your rehab plan and working with contractors to see how much is this going to cost. So putting that whole plan together, getting to that final offer before you actually sign the contract, you're looking at, you know, at least 40, 40 hours uh, of work. And if you have a big team, you're spreading those around. If you buy yourself, that, that's 40 hour a week right there that you just put in. And if you get second place, you know, you, you get the experience and you go do that again on another property. Um, so all of that, it's included on the amount of work. And like I said, the deals are being made on the details. So more and more, we have to dig in deeper. We have to look at the fine prints, at the fine line by line on the financials to understand what's going on, understand who is the management company, right? All right, what kind of, how do they operate? Like look at the other properties that the management company operates and see why is this, why are they performing that way? So having an understanding of all those things and looking you know, at really every single one of them with detail, because uh, my, my philosophy is you only as good as your last deal. Right. So if you put a deal together and you do not deliver to investors, what are you promising? That's what people are going to remember you for. <laughs> no matter how many good yeah. deals you did, they most likely are not going to be partnering with you anymore. So it doesn't matter all the successes that I've had in other properties. It's the one that I'm looking at it now is the one that I'm putting all my, my energy and stress on it underwriting. Right. So that's and all the day this to day. is to ultimately it is say that it's not to discourage anybody from getting into the syndication business. But one thing that I think it's important to understand is that it's not as easy as you might think, right? It, it's, it's like, it again, is it's a small business. And like for anybody who's ever run a small business, who have started a small business in any sort of way, you have to understand that there, you know that there are nuances, that it's not as simply as buy and hold. It may have been the case, you know, 20 years ago, uh, or maybe right after the crash where you could have bought something and did, did very little and make money, right? Correct. Right now, you can't do that. And, uh, you know, Dante and I right now, we're using, a, as you mentioned, a hybrid model, which is, is, is paying respect to the fact that it's hard to predict exactly what's going to happen in the economy. So we're running these things at, you know, 98, 90% occupancy, so we can cash flow, you know, hopefully close to nine, ten percent plus for investors, and then also create value add. And just the number of properties that you can do with that is so limited right now, as opposed to where maybe it would have been a lot easier to do, you know, in 2012. So, but anyway, the point is not to discourage you, but rather to say, okay, if you're going to get into this game, understand it's a job. It's not a side gig when it's done yeah. well. And if there is, you know, and if sometimes people are listening to uh, gurus and coaches, they are saying, oh, it's passive income. Come syndicate a deal, syndicate a deal. And this is passive income. Being a syndicator, it's not passive income, right? You're running a yeah. business and you're running uh, multiple areas of the business. You're managing the asset. You're looking at acquisitions. And especially if you are a one-person operation, two, three, you know, people operation, uh, there is a lot of work involved. There is passive, real passive income, and that's if you're doing the passive investment. So if you have the right. time, you know, being a syndicator can be lucrative, can be, uh, uh, but it's it, it's it's a job, right? It's it's owning a business, all right? And you yeah. have to approach that way. And I've seen many uh, syndicators that will put the deal together, and they'll they'll do a great job. They'll spend you know the 40, 50 hours on the writing, and once they get the deal, they hand it to the management company, and then you know they walk away, and those properties are also not going to perform. Because yeah, because there's be a present. pro forma and a pro forma tells a story about not only the a acquisition, but what needs to be done. And that what needs to be done is the part that's often skipped because yep. that's what actually yep. takes a lot of effort on an ongoing basis. And so when you're looking at um, this as a social endeavor, that's one thing to consider. But also as you're looking for, you know, people to potentially invest with a, as a limited partner, one of the things that is a rule for me is I do not invest with people uh, as a limited partner. I don't invest with any group or person for which this is not their full-time gig. It has to be a full-time gig. It's not, I'm a software engineer. By the way, I'm raising capital for, you know, 300 doors and I need, you know, $10 million. You want to join me? No, I don't want to. <laughs> 
So <laughs> Come back you. in yeah, 10 years nice. after you've learned a few things and, and lost some money a few places or something. Anyway, yeah. let's move on. One last question I want to ask you. Um, how, you know, we talked about our hybrid model, right? Um, running these things, workforce, you know, high growth markets, uh, but riding them at really high occupancy with sort of maybe slightly ambitious turn, less ambitious turnover than some of the big, you know, some of the other groups out there. How do you think um, that prepares? How, how does that fare? What other models would fare well uh, in, you know, a potential downturn in the real estate market, which, you know, as, as we've talked about, there probably will be some level of decompression at some point. We don't know when. We have no idea when, and we don't know for how long. But what, what are the elements of success, you know, to, to get through something like that? I think uh, it's approaching... Uh, the operation of your property. So I, I, I like to say that Dallas has been, Dallas and uh, in, in Florida and Phoenix and uh, Atlanta, uh, they all have been very forgiving over the past, you know, eight, nine years. Uh, any right. syndicator, any operator uh, that made mistakes, your mistakes got covered up just by the tremendous growth that we've had, right? So mm-hmm. I... I count on that, even though I believe that's going to, especially in dollars, I believe that's going to continue, not at the same level maybe that we've had it, but it's still going to continue just because of the net migration and the uh, economic development that we have here. Uh, But running those properties, like if you're preparing for something bad to happen, right? So Mm -hmm. we have uh, lots of these properties that um, that are being run without focusing marketing, uh, without a focus on looking at the numbers and looking, all right, well, how can I maximize my rehab dollars? I see a lot of money being spent just frivolously on rehab, on things that are actually not going to bring you more rent. It's not going to help you, you know, increase your income. Uh, or people coming into these properties not well capitalized also. In the mm-hmm. competitiveness of trying to get the deal, many people try start squeezing their rehab budget. So, if you're going to be holding, especially if you're putting a long-term debt on these properties, you're going to hold it for a long time, right? It's a 12-year, 10-year note with an EMA. Uh, most likely, you will want it for several years. If you're not well capitalized up front, that's going to hurt the cash on cash. And those are the properties that are going to get in trouble if we have a cool-off of occupancy and on rent growth. Because now you're going to be hurting and you're going to be having to take some of the money that you should... That, it was supposed to be cash flow to do rehabs because it did not plan ahead of time. And I see, and I try to advise clients against doing that all the time. It's like have a cushion, have extra money on your rehab budget because uh, yeah, right now everything is beautiful, but what if it changes, right? What if we have a cool off? What if shine, I mean, you know, uh, King John Moo does something crazy over there and you know, we have a cool off on, uh, on the, uh, uh, the economy. So you have to be prepared. I like, you know, and I push my management company uh, to be running these properties. Like if we are, like something is coming in 2020, which I personally don't think it will, but I'm running them uh, that way, right? I mean, with the marketing efforts, with the uh, utilization of our rehab, you know, shopping around, not just paying any price that a vendor does, but shopping around, comparing quotes and maximizing the rehab numbers and really also saving some of the rehab numbers if we need to hold the property a little longer. What are the things that I need to address now if instead of holding for four or five years, I need to hold it for eight or nine years to overcome, you know, a downturn of the economy. So I think uh, that's one big item. Also location, Uh, you know, when the market is hot and everything is going well uh, within even a strong economy and a market like uh, Dallas forward, you have pockets that are very challenging. You have pockets that the city has not been able to make improvements and invest on the infrastructure and invest on the schools. Uh, when the economy is booming and everybody is, you know, needs a place to live and everybody's moving here, you don't, you're not going to feel that as much. But as soon as there is a cool off, those are the areas that are going to be the hardest affected, right? Uh, areas that have very low income. Areas that, you know, the, the population are depending all on uh, government assistance. Those are the areas that are going to be hit the hardest uh, first. So I focus on buying on areas that I know there is uh, good working class tenants 
and there is high traffic, right? So which will save my, my costs on marketing. And it's an area where people just, they want to live. They want to be in that area, not going for the very cheap, low end of the uh, spectrum of the demographics. I think uh, that's going to play a big part. Those areas are going to be affected first, the most, uh, having something that's highly occupied and that you have good traffic, it's going to help you fare well. And, you know, the way I look at it, I think uh, a downturn or a cool off, wh whatever you want to call it, it may be positive. It may give some really good buy opportunities, you know, mm, it may, right. may, may shake kind of some of the, uh, the operators, some of the people they are not uh, performing well right now, even if we have a cool off, they're going to have to sell their property. So we may see some really good buying opportunities if there is a, a, a cool off. So I'm, I'm, I'm not scared of it. I personally don't believe it's coming to Dallas any, anytime soon, uh, but we are prepared if it comes, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll set in our properties just because it's been such a long uh, time that we've been on a ascending trend uh, with these properties. We're preparing like if it's coming. Yeah, and um, just to add to that, I think that goes along with the theme that I've talked about before, which is it's impossible to predict, um, you know, what's going to happen with the economy. I mean, if you look at the people who even four or five years ago um, have been talking about the sky falling, and in the meantime, people have made money hand over fist during that period of time. I think that, um, you know, you can have a pretty good sense of what's um uh, what may happen and, you know, do your best to, to mitigate the risks as you see them coming. But if you stop investing all day, that's a, that's a risk of losing out on, on, um, on investments uh, performance as well. So, you know, looking at things and saying there's an upside here, but the worst situation is I have capital preservation and, and, and then if I waited out a couple more years, we're going to have a nice return. And in the meantime, with the down market, we lean in. That's kind of the approach that, um, you know, I've been advocating for certainly what kind of what Dante is getting at. And also, um, I think the idea of, um, you know, again, focusing on high quality assets in high quality areas, right? And that's what we're doing, high quality assets. In our cases, basically, you know, working class you know, solid build, uh, you know, larger apartment buildings, 150, 200 units and good areas, good markets like Dallas and then not on the fringe, right? Not moving out into areas that, um, you know, chasing yield because if you chase yield right now, you're going to be very, very sorry, right? If you're going to, if you're going to, you know, shoot for those D markets, uh, you're going to, you know, look, I, I think people buying in markets like Oklahoma City right now, I think it's a bad idea. I've been saying that for a couple of years now. Tertiary markets, markets that do not have inherent strength in them and sub-markets that do not have sort of um, uh, historical strength. These are all things you've got to think about. Dante, anything else to add? Um, no, it's just, you know, uh, you know I, I believe that things, are, at least here for the DFW market and a few of the other markets that I mentioned, things are looking very uh very positive, uh, you know, and there is, we, we had 60,000 new households formed in the DFW uh, area this past year. We have occupancies, vacancies, you know, very, very, very low. Um, so it's, it's, it's going to be interesting. Uh, and, you know, already looking at 2020 and it's going to be, you know, everything is continuing uh, the same, same that we had in 2019. I already have several properties on the contract here for clients and that doesn't seem like anything is changing. So I have a very positive outlook of, uh, you know, at least as far as we can see here for the next, next couple of years that things are going to continue uh, to grow. And, you know, and just a piece of advice for people that are invest uh, passively. Yeah. Talk to other people that have invest with that operator, you know, find out how, how are things doing? I mean, everybody can put a really good, presentation everybody can learn some marketing and get in front of uh, you know an audience and sell something but are they delivering i think that's the biggest question it's the question you have to be asking uh before you commit your money your hard-earned money uh to, to to be invested with somebody else dante thank you so much for being on the show today um that's my pleasure to point out that uh, if you'd like to learn more about uh, certainly what Dante's doing, uh, you know, he's certainly part, you know, he and I are, uh, the, we have our own group 
And the only way you're going to get access to that is if you're an accredited investor within Investor Club. So if you'd like to join Investor Club, do so at wealthformula.com. Dante, thanks again so much for being on. Uh, it is a, an absolute pleasure being partners with you. I learn a lot and I'm just, uh, I'm, you know, I really admire your, you know, uh, level of meticulous underwriting and, you know, just just the, the level of detail that you put into all of these properties. Well, thank you, Buck. I appreciate your kind words. And it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to be partnering with you and a lot of your investors. And I'm looking forward. This 2020 is going to be another great year. And we're going to, you know, find more hard to find assets here and deliver great results. I'm looking forward to that. Thank you for your partnership. You got it. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show, everyone. I am so lucky to have Dante as a partner in Turo Asset Management Group in our endeavors in Dallas. He's quite the talent, and frankly, he's just a really good guy. Now, if you are an investor club, you already know this, and aren't an investor club, and you are an accredited investor, join it at wealthformula.com. We're going to have lots of cool stuff going on this year. Now, uh, before we go, I just want to go back to what we started out talking about today in, at the top of the show, that is to look at where you are today and figure out what that albatross around your neck is and get rid of it once and for all. So your call to action today is to try to identify what that 10% is and see if you can eliminate it. Life is short, my friend. If it doesn't give you joy, get rid of it. That's it for me this week on Wealth Formula Podcast. This is Buck Joffrey signing off. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast. Visit us on the web at wealthformula.com. The information contained in this podcast are opinions, not fact. As always, consult your own financial team before making any investment. See you next time.